Hey everybody, I decided to open the room up a couple minutes early just so everybody could get settled and uh, start to get ready for our program in just a couple minutes. So I'm not going to start right away, but for those of you who are here right now, I have a fun task for you to do. Maybe you're already set up for this because you're pro home learners at this point, but if you don't have a piece of paper like this and a writing surface, and maybe some, some colors, here's my colored pencils, uh, or a marker or paints or something like that, go ahead and grab those things, whoops, because um, we're gonna do a little bit of art today. I'm gonna challenge you to do an art project. So go ahead and grab some paper, some colors, some pencils, some markers, something that you're gonna draw with today. And go ahead and set it in front of you so it's easy to access throughout the program. Hey everybody who's just joining in. Um, I see lots of people flooding in, so that's super fun. I love uh, watching everybody kind of join us from all over the place. Um, for those of you who missed it, please go grab a piece of paper, something to write on and something to write with, whether it's a pencil or a marker or a crayon or paints. We're gonna do uh, some art projects today. Let's see, it looks like we have lots of people joining us. I see somebody named Landon just raise their hand. So um, maybe you've discovered the raise your hand feature. So if you wanna say hi, you can wave. Hi everyone. Oh wow, everybody's raising their hands now. <laughs> awesome. All right, looks like we have lots of people joining us. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, we have a couple minutes before we start. And I want everybody to go grab a piece of paper like this, nice and clean. It doesn't have to be white. It can be another color. Uh, and a drawing or writing utensil like a pen or a crayon or lots of crayons. I have some colored pencils. Lots of different colors are nice if you have them. But if you just have a marker or a pencil, that's awesome too. So go ahead and grab something to draw with, something to draw on. We're gonna use that today. Hey, everybody raising their hands since there's so many now, I can't see your names. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. For those of you just joining us, I know for those of you who are here from the very beginning, you've heard this a few times now, but if you're just joining us, go ahead and grab a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper and a marker or maybe some colored pencils or some crayons or some markers um, and a pencil or a pen to write with and to draw with okay hey everybody welcome thanks for coming so excited to have you all here today we're gonna start in just a few minutes I want to give everybody a chance to kind of flood in and um, and join us right before we start uh, and give everybody a chance to grab their supplies. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I'm Angie, haven't introduced myself yet. So for those of you who have been here for a couple minutes, you might be wondering who is that person on my screen? And now you know, my name's Angie and I'm gonna be taking you all on a journey today, but we're gonna wait just a couple minutes to give uh, some people a chance to join us because we're not quite at 10 o'clock yet. Hey everybody, thanks for coming, thanks for being here. It looks like we hit that 10 o'clock mark. I'm gonna give people a couple minutes because sometimes uh, people are stuck in a waiting room. So I wanna make sure that everybody's able to get in before we officially start. But for those of you that are here and waiting, go ahead and grab a paper that looks like this, it's nice and clean. Doesn't have to be white, it can be another color, maybe your favorite color. And in addition to that paper, I want you to grab something to write on. So I have this little coloring book here. And maybe a marker, definitely a marker or a pen or a pencil, and some maybe colored drawing or writing utensils, like colored pencils or markers or crayons or your favorite thing, maybe paints or, um, 
finger paints, watercolor paints, whatever you have. Something so you can add a little bit of color, maybe some words and some drawings onto that paper. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I see the number down on the bottom of my screen right here <laughs> of how many people have joined us. So it's really exciting to see um, that right now there are so many of you that are connected virtually with me. I'm Angie and connected with California State Parks, which we're going to talk about today. And I'll give people just one more minute to join us. Again, if you didn't hear already, please grab a piece of paper like this one, something to write on and something to write with. So a pen, a pencil, a marker, and then grab some colors if you have them, like crayons, markers, um, colored pencils, paints, anything you have to add some color into our lives and onto our papers today. All right. Well, it looks like we're at our time when it's time to start. So thanks everybody for listening to my, my message about grabbing your writing utensils so many times for those of you who joined us a few minutes early. And thanks everybody for being here. So go ahead and pat yourself on the back. I'm sure there's lots of third graders and fifth graders out there in the audience, but if you're not in third or fifth grade, that's awesome too. I'm so glad you're here. Pat yourself on the back. Nice job, nice job. And maybe for some of you, this is your first home learning program with State Parks. And I'm sure that some of you out here have um, been to a few of these programs before, which is so, so cool. Um, I think we should challenge everybody to go to as many different home learning programs with California State Parks as they can. Because we have so many amazing things to learn about from marine protected areas, which we're learning about today because it's MPA Monday. And the rest of the week, we have programs from all over the state of California on all different topics. So check it out. Um, I'll show you the link or I'll, bring, I'll, I'll say it later so you can explore what else we have to offer. But I'm so glad everyone's here. And without further ado, I think it's time to get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Ranger Angie, and I am going to be your host today for our home learning program. And you might know what we're talking about today just based on the name of the program and maybe based on what's behind me. This habitat might look, or this, this kind of scene behind me, might look a little bit unfamiliar to you. Maybe you've visited a lot of state parks before and you're like, hmm, I've never seen that. Um, but now is your chance. We're actually gonna virtually explore this mysterious place right behind me today and uh, learn all about the fascinating creatures that live here and explore some of the tools that we use to explore this place. So before we do any of that, I want to again, thanks everybody for being here. And I want to say thank you so much for practicing good social distancing. I know it's sort of a weird time, but um, we are all doing a really great job by staying at home, finding things to do at home, like doing virtual programs like this one and um, still finding ways to learn and enjoy um, life from inside of our homes with our families. And I wanna say thank you all so much for doing your part to help keep yourselves and your community safe and for finding fun ways to enjoy your time and continue to learn and explore the world around us. So thank you all for doing that. So for those of you who maybe just joined, I'm Ranger Angie and we are gonna get started today we are going to explore the mysteries of the deep sea. We're gonna dive into the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness. So stay tuned. Uh, if you haven't already, grab a piece of paper, something to write with, maybe some colors. So you might be able to tell based on what I'm wearing and what is right behind me, but I, of course, am an interpreter for California State Parks. And I have the really fun job of teaching people like you about some special natural places that exist in a really, really important part of California, okay? And if you wanna follow along and learn about what California State Parks is doing, what I'm doing, what my friends that work at California State Parks are doing to help bring the parks to you, go ahead and have maybe your parent or guardian follow us on Facebook, 
you can find our name right there, California State Parks North Coast Redwoods will give you sort of a view into the northern part of California, okay? And if you're on Instagram, you can also follow us at these two tags right here, specifically Ports Program. That's where you're gonna find out all the information about these fun programs and um, how to connect, what's going on, what days and what times, so make sure to follow along. Another really important thing that I wanna say before we get started is this right here. This is a really special hashtag. I'm sure some of you know what a hashtag is. Um, it's basically a way of sharing something online with a big community, right? And that's what we wanna do right now. It's really important to build community. And throughout this program, remember I asked you to grab a paper and a pen or maybe some colors. Um, I'm gonna ask you to create some ports fan art, okay? And when you're all done, just like all these students here, look, we have a Lego one here, um, they have submitted their artwork so that I could see it and share it with you because we're creating this big community, right? Um, of Ports fan art. So today, I'm gonna challenge you to create some Ports fan art. And um, we're specifically, again, gonna be diving into the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness. And as we move through the program, I'll kind of give you some prompts on what you can kind of add or what you can um, use to inspire your artwork today. So go ahead and use that hashtag so you can share your artwork with me. I'll comment and like and share if I can. Um, so thank you in advance for doing that. All right, my friends, let's explore where we are, sort of on a large scale. So if you live in the state of California, I'm sure you recognize this map right here. This, of course, is the state of California. And in the state of California, we have lots of California state parks. And maybe if you live in California, you can identify where you live on the map. Go ahead and take your finger and point to it if you can. Maybe it's somewhere up here on the North Coast, maybe the Central Coast somewhere, or maybe you live down in Southern California. Maybe you live on the coast, or maybe you live a little bit more inland. So go ahead and find roughly where your neighborhood is where your community is. And I'll go ahead and introduce that I am all the way up here in Northern California. And if you live down here, we're pretty far away from each other, probably about a 12 or 15 hour drive, which is a really long time. So I'm all the way up here in Northern California in a place called Humboldt County, a really special place. And we have some really special state parks up here in Northern California. And we're gonna actually explore where that little red arrow is and that's a place called the Lost Coast. And you might be thinking, Angie, the Lost Coast? That sounds like something out of a movie, like an Indiana Jones movie. And it is a really special place. And it might belong in a mysterious type of adventure movie because we're going on a grand adventure today to dive into the deep sea, which is um, a very strange and mysterious place. And we're gonna go all the way up here in this Part of California where there's not very many people um, living compared to some of our bigger cities, maybe like Sacramento or San Francisco or Los Angeles. We're going to explore the Lost Coast today, specifically the deep sea. And up here in Humboldt County, if you're from around this area, this scene behind me looks really, really familiar. Um, these trees are sort of like Part, a really important part of our culture up here in Northern California. And these trees are actually the tallest trees in the world, right? So we have up here in Northern California, along uh, some of the Lost Coast, the tallest trees in the world. And if you know what they are, go ahead and shout it out or maybe say it to um, somebody who's sitting next to you, whether it's your parent or your sibling or somebody else in your household. Some of you might have said, redwood trees and that is absolutely right redwood trees live up here in northern california and we're really lucky because many of them are protected in california state parks okay so only about five percent a little bit less than five percent of the old growth redwood trees these trees are thousands of years old hundreds of feet tall are still alive today or still standing today and many of them are protected in our parks. So we're really lucky to have places where we've said, you know what, we're gonna leave these forests so people can come visit them and explore them. That's what my sort of habitat looks like up here. 
But of course, you can maybe imagine what your habitat or, or what a natural place near your house looks like. Um, but I wanted to give you a little sneak peek of what it looks like up here. And if you were to ever to come visit our parks, when we can all visit our parks again, I encourage you to come check out the redwoods because they are super neat. But of course, we all share this one sort of um, ecosystem <laughs> in common. That might be a stretch, but here we are looking at planet Earth from outer space. Okay, so we all live on this beautiful marble that's suspended in space. Makes you feel small, doesn't it? And I want you to go ahead and observe this beautiful picture and think what is the most common color you see? If you grab some colored pencils or some markers, go ahead and pick um, the color from your set of colors that represents the color you see the most on this picture. Now, if you picked up a blue marker or a blue crayon, you're absolutely right. Our planet is mostly covered by blue. And I'm sure you know what all of that blue is. Of course, it's our ocean, right? And we actually have many names for our ocean, but really it's just one big ocean that kind of spans across the entire surface of our planet. Okay, and that's what we're gonna explore today. So based on this picture, I want you to maybe guess, or you can write it down on your paper, maybe one side for art and one side for words. Um, what percentage or a number from one to 100 is of our planet is covered by water or covered by blue? Hmm. Do we think it's most of the planet? Yeah, remember I said it's the most common color. And actually the, the, um, the ocean takes up about, if I were to make a pizza pie and um, kind of represent how much of that pizza is the oceans, it would look like that, about 71% of our planet is covered by oceans. And of course, all of us land dwelling creatures like humans and all of our, our pets and other land animals that we love and know live on this small pizza pie slice of our planet, which makes up about 29%, okay? So we know this 29% pretty well, and we know that we have California State Parks in that 29%, but we have this big, 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 big slice of pizza that makes up our oceans, right? And in our oceans, we also have special places that are really like California State Parks. They're protecting special habitats like the redwoods, um, but they, those places are underwater. So today we're going to explore these things, California's marine protected areas. And that's why today, of course, we've called it MPA Monday. M for marine, P for protected, and A for area, marine protected areas. So that's what we're going to explore today. So to get you in the ocean mood, I want to ask you to close your eyes and imagine an underwater scene something underwater. Maybe it's an animal, maybe it's their house where they live, and kind of keep that memory in your mind. And I want to give you a sneak peek of what it looks like um, in California's ocean. You might recognize some of these animals. Maybe you've learned about some of these habitats from other programs. Amazing, all of these um, habitats and these animals live off the coast of California. Maybe the state where you live or a place that you wanna visit, but it's hard to tell because when we look out at the ocean, all we see is a big blue body of water. But in fact, there is so much life thriving underneath the surface. So maybe that looks similar to what you imagined when you closed your eyes, or maybe it was a little bit different. Maybe you're surprised or shocked or in awe of the beauty of our life that lives off the coast of California. Um, but now I want you to think, uh, maybe kind of remember something you've learned about before, or maybe come up with an idea or a hypothesis about something that might be threatening our oceans today. So maybe something that's um, kind of getting, putting our oceans in a, in a bad place. Maybe you've heard about something 
or you have an idea about something. Some of you might be saying pollution. That's what a lot of my students say. And yeah, there is a problem with pollution in our oceans, absolutely. Um, and there's another big problem that's happening sort of in our world's oceans. Remember, we looked at that big planet Earth and we, we learned there's really just one big ocean with many names, okay? And in our one big ocean, there's this problem that's called overfishing. So I put this little diagram here so you can see what this looks like. Basically, overfishing is when we take too much out of the ocean at once. You might be thinking, oh yeah, we take certain things out of the ocean like fish that we might like to eat or sell. Um, we maybe take shells. Maybe when we go to the beach, we collect the prettiest shells we see. Uh, we take a lot of things from the ocean. And sometimes we can take too much. And as you can imagine, um, it's not so great for the ocean. So we're really lucky in California because we don't have too much of a problem with overfishing, but we decided to create these marine protected areas so that we could kind of get ahead of the curve, uh, kind of be proactive and make sure that this scene never happens in California. Okay, and that's what marine protected areas do. So I wanna show you this picture that shows you an MPA on one side, a marine protected area, and a um, unprotected area on the other. So you might make some observations, like, well, on this side you see somebody fishing, somebody taking something out of the ocean, which is totally fine and great, but we've created MPAs, which are just special places where we're like, you know what, we're not gonna do that here, so that the animals and um, their habitat can thrive, okay? So on this side you might notice, oh, Angie, there's so many more fish over there. There's also birds flying above, seabirds, and these are pelicans. And there's a sea otter, which is a predator. And it's actually really good when there's predators in a habitat because they help to keep things in balance. So on this side, it's not that we just see more fish, but we see more types of fish. So more diversity, which is a good thing. And we also see lots of habitat like kelp right here, like we saw in the video. So this is what an MPA might look like compared to this side over here, where you see a lot less of those things. Right? So we have less diversity, um, less numbers of animals, and even we don't have our sea otters and we don't have our, our seabirds flying in the sky. Right, So I hope that helps you understand what an MPA is and what it can do to the underwater world. They're pretty awesome. So back to the state of California, before we really dive in to the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness, I want to kind of have everybody categorize or uh, think in their minds what type of habitat they live near. So I told you that I live up here in the redwoods. This is what my sort of habitat, my ecosystem looks like. Um, but some people might live in a high alpine forest like this. Maybe you live near Yosemite, or you might live near the desert or another habitat. So I want you to think of that habitat right now. And notice that in California, we have tons of different habitats. We don't have redwoods all across the state. We live in a very big state. Um, and so that, again, is that diversity. We have it on land, but we also have it underwater, okay? So in our marine environment or our watery environments, we have things like estuaries. Maybe you live near a bay like I do. Uh, we have rocky reefs. We have the deep sea, of course, which is what we're gonna explore today. We have sandy bottom environments. Tide pools, maybe this is a place that you like to visit and explore. And we also have kelp forests. So I want you to think of these different habitats like how many, all the different habitats that we have in California on land, right? So our ocean is just as diverse or just has just as much variety as our land does. All right, my friends, so here is an illustration. This might give you some inspiration for your Ports fan art. My page is blank right now because I've been busy talking, but maybe this will give you some inspiration for colors. And this picture right behind me shows um, some of the things that live in our marine protected areas. You can see there's all different types of animals. We have fish, we have mammals, we have invertebrates, which are these kind of crazy funky looking animals over here. Um, and we have birds, like the birds over here. Uh, amazing diversity, right? Lots of colors. And that's what the underwater world is like. It's really colorful, especially in our NPAs. And today, 
we're going to go to this side of the picture, <laughs> which is a little bit dark and maybe looks a little scary and mysterious. And this is the habitat that we rarely get to visit. All the other habitats are a little bit easier to visit. Um, so we're going to go to that place that's really hard to visit, very mysterious. That's why today I'm using a cool green screen studio to bring you down into the deep sea. We're going to discover what lives in the darkness. And to give you a little sneak peek, this is a sample of what we might see. Make some observations. Maybe um, make some notes for your ports fan art. Some of the things that we see here are pretty weird looking. They might even look sort of alien to you. You might notice some things about this place that we're looking at. You might say, wow, that looks like an alien world. And if you thought that, I thought the same thing when I first started learning about the deep sea. I said, you know what, I think the deep sea is a lot like outer space. And in a lot of ways, it's true, because both places are dark. I'll talk a little bit more about that. They're very far away, and they're not very easy places for humans to survive. So I want you to think now, if you were going to be an outer space explorer, somebody who is going to go into outer space, maybe discover um, a new planet, <laughs> or uh, discover what exists on a planet that we know of, what would you need? What type of equipment? Could you just go out in your jeans and t-shirt and drive your car into outer space? No. What type of stuff would you need? Write it down or share it with somebody next to you. You might be thinking, I know all about this. I love outer space. And I would need a spacesuit that looks like this. Yeah, you would need a spacesuit because our bodies are not adapted. They're not set up to survive in the outer space environment. Let me tell you that. So we would need a spacesuit. And of course, we can't just drive our car or our boat out into outer space. We need something that looks like this, a spaceship, some special tools to help us explore this mysterious habitat. And we need similar things for exploring the ocean and exploring the deep sea, OK? So here is another image that might seem like, whoa, those look like alien creatures. That's what I always think when I see stuff like this. And I myself love to explore the ocean. And I do that with some special gear, sort of similar to the stuff that I showed you for exploring outer space. I'm going to go ahead and change uniforms really quick. Whoa, there I am. That was the fastest uniform change that I've ever done. I am now dressed in my scuba uniform. So I'm wearing a wetsuit to help keep my body warm and protected. I am breathing off of something called a regulator to give me air, and I have a mask so I can see out of my eyes. Right, so this is really similar to the spacesuits that we use to explore outer space. And when we go into the deep sea, here I am again, <laughs> quick uniform change, um, into this place to see alien creatures like this one, and this one, and this one, and maybe even that one, <laughs> and that one, and that one. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll notice, or maybe you'll learn today, that we can't actually easily use our same old scuba gear to explore the deep sea. And there's a few reasons, but we're not gonna talk too much about those today. We're gonna talk about what we do use to explore these places, and, oh bam. There it is. This is an amazing machine. And this is gonna be the inspiration for your ports fan art today. This right here is called a remotely operated vehicle or an ROV. Maybe try saying that out loud, remotely operated vehicle. And this ROV is called the Beagle. Everyone say, hi Beagle. The Beagle is going to, much like our spaceship, go down into the deep sea to explore and discover what lives in the darkness, okay? And I want you all to create a deep sea machine, maybe similar to the Beagle or maybe totally different, that helps in some way 
to explore and protect the ocean. And if you share your artwork with me, like I said before, I'll share it. So as we learn about the deep sea, maybe you'll have some ideas of what type of tools your machine will need to help explore this habitat. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the deep sea. I've created a diagram for you, and I want you all to imagine um, 36,000 feet. Might be hard to do, but that is how deep, the deepest part of the ocean is. And you might be thinking, uh, 36,000, I don't really know what that looks like or how far away that is. So I have an idea for you. I want you now to imagine a football field. Maybe you've seen one in person or seen one on TV, and you can imagine running from one end zone to the other without stopping. And you can probably agree that you would be pretty tired if you were to run all the way from one end zone to the other without stopping. Now, imagine doing that 100 times. You would be very, very, very tired, probably out of breath. And that's the same as the distance from the surface of the ocean all the way down to the very deepest part, 36,000 feet. It's pretty far away. But the deep sea actually begins at about 650 feet, which is a lot shallower, but still very deep. And that's sort of the same as two Statues of Liberty stacked on top of each other. And when we get down to this depth, something really important happens, and that is, it's like somebody turned off the lights. There is not very much light in the deep sea. So maybe as you're drawing your deep sea machine, for exploring and protecting the oceans, you might need to think about, hmm, I might need some lights. We'll see. And of course, um, we're gonna explore a deep sea habitat that's actually more about at 2,000 feet, that's right off here, off the Lost Coast. Remember that place where you were like, hmm, that sounds like um, a place out of maybe Indiana Jones or something really cool like that. That's exactly right. You can see there's not very many towns or big buildings or anything off the Lost Coast. And you would never know by just looking out at the ocean that there is a deep sea habitat right there. This is what it looks like on a map, okay? Because of course, we're gonna go into a marine protected area, those places that are underwater that are a lot like state parks. And that's where we're gonna dive in to discover uh, what lives in darkness, okay? We're going to dive into Matoll Canyon State Marine Reserve, and you might notice it's red. Kind of red like a stoplight means stop. This is a place where we are not allowed to take anything out of the habitat, which is awesome because it allows the animals to grow bigger and older, and I'll talk more about that later, but just like our parks that are protecting those trees, letting them get bigger and taller so that people can visit them and learn about them. Right here in our marine protected area, Matoll Canyon, that's where we're going to go. And we're going to use our trusty remotely operated vehicle called the Beagle. Everyone remembers the Beagle from before. You might be gaining some inspiration for your art project based on the Beagle. The Beagle. And this will be a really good helper for you as you start to design this machine. I want you to watch this video of my friends right here. They're all going to put the Beagle into the water off the coast of the Lost Coast. And I want you to notice what the beagle has on it to help it explore the, this habitat. So look closely. You might notice that the boat is rocking and rolling because the ocean is not always very calm <laughs> up here on the North Coast. You might notice this looks really heavy. Why do you think that the ROV needs to be heavy? What types of gear do you see on there that might help the beagle explore the deep sea? All right, my friends, and much like a remote control that you maybe you have for video games. That's how we control the beagle um, in our marine protected area as well. You might have noticed they have lights and there's actually seven cameras on the beagle that serve different purposes, but the main one is so that we can see 
what the beagle sees as it explores the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness. So we're going to dive down. And now I want you to observe this habitat. The beagle has now arrived at the deep sea or at about 2,000 feet below the surface. And I want you to observe what this place looks like. Is it different than you imagine? You might notice that there's lots of rocks. It's not all flat. There's some sand. There's lots of colors. And usually all those colors are different animals. Even if they don't look like animals, they usually are. Especially in the deep sea because animals can look pretty alien-like and they live in darkness all the time, right? It's like if it was always nighttime on land, that's what it's like to live down here. So the animals that live there, um, they get used to this environment. And in, so in some cases, they're adapted to this environment. So you might be thinking, I'm sure we're gonna see fish in the deep sea. And that is absolutely right. There are fish in the deep sea, like these fish right here called rockfish. And I wanna introduce you to some special rockfish. Uh, that are basically like the mascots, in some cases, of marine protected areas. Like our state park logo has a bear. That's sort of like our mascot. Maybe like you have a school mascot. Think about what it is right now. But in the deep sea, or in our marine protected areas, I should say, our mascot is a rockfish. And I want to introduce you to a special type of rockfish. Um, well, I'll show you this one first because this one's really cool looking. This rockfish has a cool mohawk. And you might be thinking, why are they called rockfish? Do they love rock and roll? And um, they might like rock and roll. I actually have never asked them. But they do have these cool mohawks, these little spines on their head. Good defense mechanism. Um, and her rockfish are actually similar to you and I in some ways. They like to eat similar things. So if you like to eat seafood, Maybe you like to eat crab or shrimp or calamari or octopus or squid or shrimp. Um, you have a similar diet to the rockfish because that's what they like to eat. And they also like to eat worms, which I'm sure a lot of you like to eat as well. So now let's meet that mascot that I was talking about of our MPAs. You can see this fish right here. This rockfish is a little bit smaller. And then, whoa, we've got this huge rockfish right in front of us. You can see it's moving a little bit slowly, but they can also swim pretty fast. And this rockfish right here is really special because it's called a big, old, fertile female fish, or a boff. And basically, as we let fish get bigger and bigger and bigger, they do something really special. It's almost like they have a superpower. And I'm going to tell you about that superpower right now. So I have one fish right here, and this fish is about seven years old. Maybe some of you are seven years old, or you know somebody who's seven years old. Um, and I want you to guess how many babies this seven-year-old fish can have. It's about a little shorter than my um, arm right here. Maybe you guessed seven, or maybe you guessed one. Um, but these fish are a lot different than humans, because this seven-year-old rockfish can have 100 and 50,000 babies. And those babies are the size of an eyelash when they come out. So maybe if you've ever had an eyelash on your face, you um, put it on your finger and you blow to make a wish. So you can see how that eyelash weighs about nothing and it flies away just with that little puff of breath. And when these larvae or these babies come out of the rockfish, they are also that vulnerable or that able to move around. So they're often moved around by the currents of the ocean and the waves and things like that. Now in our marine protected areas, we have those mascots that I was talking about called big old fertile female fish. And this fish right here lives in an MPA. It was able to grow to 18 years old. You can see it's much bigger as well. And this big old fish um, can also have some babies. And now I want you to guess how many babies can this rockfish have now that it's 11 years older. Maybe you know an 18 year old yourself. Remember, they sort of have a superpower, especially when they get older. Maybe you guessed they can have more. Maybe you guessed they can have less. 
but this rockfish right here can have 1,700,000 babies in its 18 years of life, which is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more than the small fish. So just like in state parks, how we let redwoods grow for a long time and grow really, really big, MPAs help our fish grow really big. And they have lots of babies that then are carried away by the currents and can land outside of marine protected areas in places where maybe we can catch them. All right, so that's a little bit about rockfish, our mascot for MPAs. I wanna introduce you to another very strange animal that is one of my favorites called the giant California sea cucumber. You might be thinking, what? Why is it called a sea cucumber? That does not look like the sea cucumbers that I like to eat. Or sorry, the cucumbers that I like to eat that maybe you have in your fridge. Um, so here's our sea cucumber and they are kind of shaped like a cucumber that maybe you'd like to eat. But of course, these sea cucumbers are a little bit different. They have some legs on the bottom that help them kind of crawl along the deep sea. They have some kind of freckles almost on their body. Maybe if you have freckles, you're similar to a sea cucumber. And right here, they have a mouth. And in that mouth, they have a very special tool that they use to eat. So you might notice that on the ground here, um, we see probably some rocks and maybe some sand, but especially right here, we see a lot of like brown stuff. And this is basically debris or stuff that kind of falls from the surface of the ocean down into the deep sea. And it's called marine snow. So maybe you live in the snow. Um, and did you know that in the ocean there's also snow? And this marine debris, this marine snow can be dead animals. It can be decomposing plants from land or decomposing algae. Um, and sometimes it can even be um, some of our trash. So sometimes the beetle will actually find human waste, human plastic, things like that in the deep sea, okay? And these animals right here, the giant California sea cucumbers, they eat that marine snow. And in order to do that, they open up their mouths, which are right here, <laughs> as they're crawling along the bottom, and they let something out of their mouth that is kind of similar to our tongue that helps them eat, okay? And this thing looks like this. They're sort of these white tentacles that reach out of their mouth. Imagine if your tongue could reach out of your mouth, grab its food and bring it back in. That would be pretty strange and very alien-like, just like these animals. Um, and they actually pick up sand that's covered in that marine snow and they can pass 300 pounds of sand covered in marine snow through their bodies. They basically eat the marine snow and then they poop out clean sand. So they're sort of like the vacuum cleaners of the deep sea. Let's take a look. There they are. They're called oral tube feet. They reach out, grab the sand covered in marine snow, and bring it into their bodies. 300 pounds in one year. That's about the weight of your refrigerator. Pretty amazing and bizarre. So now I have a challenge for you. One of the things that we do when we go to the deep sea as deep sea explorers, discovering what lives in darkness, is we count how many animals we see. So I wanna challenge you and the person next to you, if you have somebody there with you, um, but if not, that's okay too, to count how many sea cucumbers you see. So there's a hint, there's one right here in this video. All right, my friends, I know it goes by fast, but that's what it's like to be a deep sea explorer. So did you count some sea cucumbers? If you did, raise your hand. I can see people raising their hands right down here. Woo! I've got almost 100 people raising their hands, so you counted some. Awesome job. 
maybe write down your final number on your piece of paper. And then when you share it with me, I can know if you got the number right. If you got 16, you're right. There was about 16, I'm pretty sure there's 16 sea cucumbers in that video. And when we go into the deep sea to discover what lives in darkness, one of the things that we do as deep sea explorers is count how many animals there are um, to get an idea of what their population looks like, what their community looks like, um, how many of them there are, and sometimes even how big they are. You might have noticed two little kind of laser dots in the video as well. These help deep sea researchers to size animals, to figure out how big they are. And remember, in the case of the boffs, or the big old fertile female fish, our marine protected area mascots, um, they are, it's really important when we know how big they are, because sometimes it helps us to tell how old they are as well. All right, my friends, I have saved a special treat for the end, because I think this animal is really, really, really cool. Um, and really special, and probably my favorite animal that we find in the deep sea. So we're gonna let this animal do its thing. It's gonna maybe look like it's dancing around a little bit. So if you feel like you're ready to dance, maybe stand up, and as we watch this animal move around, you can mimic what it's doing. This animal right here you might recognize as an octopus. And you might know uh, that this animal has a lot of arms. They have eight arms. And they use them, obviously, to swim and kind of move. And each arm has two rows of suction cups to help it to kind of grab its prey and move around. And this particular octopus is called the giant Pacific octopus. And they call it a giant Pacific octopus because they can get really, really, really big. They can be up to 16 feet um, in width or length, uh, depending on how the octopus is sort of moving around. And that's sort of like two garage doors put next to each other. Huge. And they, the heaviest one they've ever found was 600 pounds. So they can be really big. This one is not that big but um, it is a good size. Now, the coolest thing about the giant Pacific octopus is I kind of like to think of them like they're a character in The Incredibles because they have a super suit, which is their amazing um, skin, basically. They have the superpower of camouflage. So they use these special cells. Maybe you can think of it like their super suit is made out of these cells that are called chromatophores and eridocytes. And those cells can change color. And this animal is really a master of camouflage. So maybe you're moving around like the giant Pacific octopus, moving your legs and moving your arms. These are really smart animals. Oh look, we know what those are. We learned about those already. Sea cucumbers. <laughs> And I would say that the coolest thing about the, well, there's many cool things about the giant Pacific octopus, but one really cool thing is that they have something in common with us as well. They also have a heart. Everyone put your hand on your heart. We're all connected by the beating of our heart, right? And these animals don't just have one heart. They have three, three hearts. So they are big lovers, that's for sure. And instead of red blood, like we have, maybe you've gotten a scrape or a cut before and you've noticed, hey, my blood is red. These animals have blue blood. Pretty amazing. I know I could watch this forever because they are just so interesting as they kind of move about. But let's go ahead and move on. So today we have discovered some of the animals that live in darkness in the deep sea. We've learned about some of the tools that we use to explore those places. Maybe you've come up with your own tool, your own machine that's used to explore the deep sea and help protect the ocean. Uh, we learned about rockfish and sea cucumbers and giant Pacific octopus, all things that the beetle got to observe on its dive into the deep sea. And one thing that I wanna mention, um, this fish right here looks a little different than our boff, 
than our um, rockfish, but this is also a type of rockfish, and they are homebodies. So I know right now all of us are at home and we're maybe homebodies more than normal, which is a really good thing, and I want to say thank you all for doing that. And we're similar to the rockfish because they have a pretty small home range. So they like to stay in one small area for most of their life. And um, that's kind of, we're practicing that right now with our social distancing and being at home. So let the rockfish be an inspiration to you. All right, so let's zoom back out to, the, to planet Earth here. Uh, we learned about how the ocean, we have one big ocean that has many names and it covers most of our planet. And now I wanna talk about protection. So we talked about parks, we talked about MPAs. And um, I wanna go ahead and tell you that um, only about 12% of land on Earth is protected. So a lot of that's in uh, state parks or national parks or nature preserves or things like that, 12%. But when we look at the ocean, this body of water that um, takes up most of our planet and has these mysterious habitats with animals that we haven't even yet, we haven't even discovered yet, um, we only have about 4% globally in our whole planet um, that's protected. So maybe you think that's awesome, that's a good amount. Maybe you think, eh, or maybe you think we should definitely have more, right? And all of you can help make sure that if you think that number needs to be higher, that we keep protecting our oceans. So we can keep exploring places and discovering things that live in areas that we can't always um, have the most information about, right? And we're really lucky because in California, if you're a Californian, you can do a little happy dance, woo! Because in California, instead of that kind of global average of 4%, we have protected 16% of our ocean because we protect kelp forests, rocky reefs, tide pools, estuaries, and the deep sea and sandy bottom environments. Lots of different habitats where lots of animals live. So we're giving those places, those animals a safe place where they can live and grow and have lots of babies and we can visit them maybe uh, like we visit our parks. We can scuba dive there, we can kayak, we can surf, we can do lots of fun things that don't involve taking animals out of their home. So with that, I'll go ahead and say thank you everybody so much for joining us today for this home learning program. Tune in for the rest of the day because every program today is gonna be about marine protected areas or MPAs. And one last reminder, find us online so we can stay in touch, so we can build that big community uh, where we can all kind of share artwork and share ideas. And you can join these students right here that have all contributed to Port's fan art. So I know we started with a blank page at the beginning of the program, but I hope that you have a fun idea for a machine that can help us monitor the deep sea and protect the ocean because we know it's really important to protect these habitats and the animals that live there. So go ahead and finish up your artwork and then have somebody post it online for you under the hashtag Ports Fan Art so that we can share it or you can share it with us. We can see it and maybe share it with future students. It can be Legos, it can be pencil, it can be um, paint, get creative. I want to see what you come up with. So thanks everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.